I, I guess we are all here. Vince, are we recording? Yes, sir. All right. Let's all rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag to of the United States of America and to the republic and for which, which it stands, stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, roll call, please. Mrs. Fryrick? Here. Mr. Posnow? Here. Mr. Robinson? Here. Mr. Sanders? Here. Mr. Scalette? Here. Mrs. Schrader? Here. Mr. Sears? Here. Mr. Sullivan? Here. Mr. Toman? Here. Nine members present. Thank you. Uh, this will be the first opportunity for public comment. Does everybody have time to finish? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, there was a link online to uh, the minutes of the regular monthly meeting of March 22nd. If there are no uh, corrections or changes, I would offer them to be approved as submitted. So moved. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, we're coming up on a, on a really busy time for the school. We're closing out a school year, we're planning budgets. There's a lot going on. 
And I just wanted to take a minute and kind of reflect a little. This year, the world's gone through extreme cha ch challenges. Our community is no exception. We've endured rapidly spreading illness and death, isolation and closed businesses. The last of these resulted in lost income and wage stagnation for many. Our public schools haven't been spared any of these challenges. Over the span of a couple of weeks in 2020, school districts were asked to transition to a remote in-home learning model. The primary objective in every district was to maximize the quality of education available while ensuring the safety of both students and staff. District curricula had to be redesigned into a remote model. This transition was challenging for parents, students, and faculty. While some students thrived, some struggled. To date, we have seen prognostications that our students have experienced performance losses. Even the Pennsylvania Department of Education is earmarking funding to, to be dedicated to learning loss. The only way to know for sure though is through the issuance of our annual standardized testing to see what, a, what effect the pandemic has actually had on learning. And now, now that all willing teachers have been vaccinated and vaccines are becoming available through the general population, the primary concern is the return of all students to full-time in-person in instruction. While districts look to return to traditional schooling, they must figure out how to support those that choose to remain in remote learning. Now, I think students choose to remit the remote option for a variety of reasons, safety, convenience, perceived school district quality, or learning preferences. Whatever the reason, we should expect equitable quality between in-person learning and online learning. In Pennsylvania, families that choose cyber charter simply do not receive the same quality that they would receive in person. The York School District pays over 2.8 million an annually to fund 183 students who selected a charter option. That's roughly $15,000 per student and twice that for special education. Because the state provides a district less than $900 per student, our local taxpayers fund the difference with no expectation of similar quality and the difference in quality is striking. The proficiency gap across the state between public schools and cyber is over 21%. In York Suburban, the gap is much higher. As well, graduation trends are worse. Now in 2017, the legislature took steps to address these shortcomings. Versions of House Bill 97 were passed by both chambers. A key tenet of this bill was the ability for a local district to hold charter schools accountable for performance. If the achievement gap was greater than 15%, local funding could be withheld until the charter school improved. It appears this bill was sent to committee after both sides passed it, and it seems to have disappeared. The story for in-person support's not much better. The disparity in basic education funding across the county is sizable. The Legislature Pact Act 35 in 2016 formalizing what was called a fair funding formula that was based on needs and population. Unfortunately, the executive and legislative branches chose to only run increased funding through that formula, which meant that the bulk of school funding was applied using a decades old model, penalizing growing districts to the benefit of shrinking districts. Now we don't need to look very far to see the inequality. In 2019, you know, I mentioned before, York Suburban received less than $900 per student. Other schools in our county received twice as much or more. The result is an undue burden based on local property taxpayers. The disparity means that York Suburban taxpayers are asked to fund nearly 80% of all of our educational costs, including all the unfunded mandates, including charter school tuition prescribed by the state. Local school boards work to keep the burden on their communities as low as possible while maintaining quality and a balanced budget. Most tax revenue goes directly to paying expenses. Some contributes to fund balances which serve as savings accounts. These come in three flavors. They're committed, they're assigned, and they're unassigned. Committed fund balances are designated by the board for specific purposes like as building projects. Assigned fund balances are also designated by the board and are intended for anticipated long-term costs, such as healthcare coverage, pension costs, or even some construction. The unsigned fund balances or what the school district reserves for emergencies or delays. Uh, we often see delays in their state funding. It happens more often than you would think in Pennsylvania. So why am I talking about fund balances? 
growth in expenses is outstripping our ability to raise revenue to meet those expenses. If fund balances are frequently used to meet those gaps, the school district has a long-term problem that it can't address. In our households, when expenses outstrip revenue, we simply change our lifestyle to fit expenses. In the school district, it's not that simple. Many of the school, the district costs are fixed. They're mandated by state requirements and by contract costs. Reducing expenses requires removing programs and removing staff, impacting the quality of our educational programs. So we're kind of trapped. School boards and communities weigh these difficult decisions when faced with higher taxes and lacking state support. If our legislature continues to ignore the flawed state of school district funding, and there's no indication of change on the horizon, districts will be forced to re-examine current educational programming at the detriment of quality. So I would ask all of you listening to reach out to your legislators and, and speak to them directly. They are not as sympathetic as you would expect to the challenges of York Suburban School District. So that's my little speech. And with that, I will be quiet and pass things over to Dr. Williams. Thank you for letting me ramble. Uh, excuse me, John, may I ask a question? Are your remarks going to be part of the minutes? Um, I think they can be, or I, I can I can certainly forward them. Yeah, I, I would suggest that's a good idea. Thank you for that. Okay. Dr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Pazio. Uh, as many of you are aware, we have been talking about uh, grade level realignment and, and trying to figure out what we're going to do with our facilities going forward. And to that end, uh, Mr. Pazio has formed an ad hoc, ad hoc committee and put uh, Dr. Krauser uh, as a chairperson of that committee. And I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Krauser for him to share with us uh, some details uh, about the committee and what their, their plan is going forward. Great, thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm gonna kind of share my screen here real quick. So, um, as Dr. Williams mentioned, uh, the board and conversations have existed for the last two and a half years. Um, and I think Mr. Posnow's introduction this evening certainly teed this up nicely uh, when we start talking about the complexities of, of where we are with organizing um, the goals of the district and how they align with our finances, facilities, and our instructional programming. So uh, what I'm going to share this evening is kind of unpack where we are to date uh, with this committee and, and the steps moving forward. So I'm kind of take a trip down memory lane and similar to what Dr. Williams said, we, we came to these crossroads both in our facilities and finance meetings as well as our uh, academic standards meeting where we kind of started to join in these questions about our fiscal responsibilities, our facility responsibilities, and inevitably our responsibilities to our learners and um, trying to sort out a direction. And that, uh, that of course led the charge that we have before us uh, as a committee where we're seeking options for optimal academic uh, opportunities for all YS students built in a system that's sustainable uh, for our fiscal and facility means. So kind of to talk a little bit about where we're going, uh, you'll recognize this stool. Dr. Williams has shared this on, on many occasions. Uh, this three-legged stool represents kind of the structure of where we've been going with these conversations, specifically dependent legs of the stool, uh, educational program, finance facilities, supporting the goals of our district, those four beacons. And then of course that holds above us our vision, our end in mind of where we're going. And then of course the mission and how we're getting there. So that's kind of been our guiding uh, structure that we've been talking about. And as Dr. Williams had mentioned, we're seeing some fractures along the way in some of these legs to this stool, which of course uh, requires us to dig a little bit deeper into the complexities. So when we look at each one of these legs of that stool in its in, um, independent state, um, they become very complex. So first of all, our educational programming certainly involves our students and our teachers, um, the high quality teaching and learning that's occurring inside the classrooms, how we're meeting the needs of our students, how we're meeting the needs of the diversity within our students uh, and their individual needs as they move forward. Mr. Pose now did an excellent job talking about the complexities with finance um, and that growing concern we have both what we're getting from the state or not getting from the state and how that's applying to our uh, revenue and expenditures. And then lastly, we have the complexities of our facilities. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have a variety of uh, beautiful structures here at the York Suburban School District, but some are aging and these facilities um, are in growing need. When you begin to bring those 
complex natures together, they, they really start to overlap. And that's where we see the three legs of that stool really kind of come together as a whole. And when we start to think about ourselves as a system and we start to really kind of tease out and lay those complexities over and over again, it becomes more comprehensive. It becomes a little bit larger and inevitably it paints a picture of who we are. So knowing that there's a complexity of these three legs of that stool, we need to take who we are as an organization, to come back to where we're going with our, with our district goals and slowly lay over these complexities. And this will be hopefully our binding point as we begin this process. So from this end uh, and the charge from the board, we begin the process of how to organize these three legs of that stool to begin the process to unpack uh, options and proposal for the board by November. So to do that first, as always, we start with that vision, which we've continued to talk about, the hard work and dedication from the individuals involved with the comprehensive plan, unpack that vision of where we're going, that's our end in mind. The board then worked closely to align these strategic principles. So this kind of opens the framework, then how we're working within those three stool legs to think of our instructional planning as well as our physical plan and fiscal means. These principles help guide the directions of this committee as we're moving forward to ensure that we have the sustainability as well as meeting the needs of all of our learners. And of course, lastly, we put our boots on the ground and we, and we work to achieve that through our bold future actions. Um, so I want to pause for a moment, and, and when we began this process and we started to bring the community together at an administrative level, we, we continue to talk about a systems approach here. Uh, if we go back in time, and I'll use Mr. Posnow's intro there, we talked about, you know, a fair funding formula of the past, which was everybody got equal, you know, everyone was treated the same. Well, that's, that's not how it works anymore, and we need to generate a level of equi uh, equity and move away from equality because every single person or event needs to have access. And that access um, is what we wanna achieve here. We want to be given different supports to help them achieve and make access and using a game, for example. So using this equity lens, we really started to look at our system. And here's where we start to say, okay, we have an opportunity now to look and propose for the board options at a systems level. So what systemic barriers can we start to reduce to reduce those needs for supports and accommodations? So looking at the fence as something as a barrier. So we want to keep our eye on the equity, providing available access to all, but how do we build a system that allows us to reduce those as much as possible so that we can achieve that equity at a high level? So how do we do that? Um, again, you'll notice this, this fine dressed gentleman is trying to reduce the questions that have come along on this journey. So the first one is this focus on our learning, which is our educational program. Um, and, and this committee uh, is representative of teachers, uh, students, community members, administrators, and we're working uh, together to, to make a sense of where we are as a learning community, what we need using the guiding goals of the comprehensive plan to lay that structure in place. Similar to that three-legged stool, we do have to come back to those other two components. And, and the next is sustainability. How are we gonna have a fiscal process in place? So here's where Mrs. Chichuli and her team are really starting to dive into what does it look like from a financial lens to help us develop something that's sustainable that will inevitably meet with both ends of our learning and lastly now the environment. So we've worked with and recruited the use of Crabtree Rural Associates um, to, to dive into our environments. They're familiar with our systems. Um, they've had an opportunity to review some of our feasibility options. So they can start to bring together this data and this piece. So inevitably we can come back together to come to that single direction of where we wanna go and think about the future and what are we focused on to ensure that we're addressing the needs of all of our students and all of their learning at the optimal academic opportunity in a sustainable way that's fiscally sound and responsible and creates and ensures the environments or our facilities are, are, are matched and aligned to create equity and reduce as much as, as possible uh, inhibitors for each student to, to reach that access. So how do we do that? Well, it really requires these three groups together to engage in a series of activities as we move forward. So you can kind of see these three committees. As I mentioned, the Learning uh, Future Focused Learning Committee, 
A Crabtree Roarbone Associates is, is really focusing on our on our structures and our facilities. And then, of course, Mrs. Chichuli in the business office at the bottom is working on our finances. So through the months of April and May, we're gathering information and an analyzing data. Uh, this Actually, this week, uh, the, the community committee will be meeting uh, where we're really going to assess uh, what information we have on hand, pick up where the comprehensive plan left off and prepare the first stages in data collection of our students, our, our community, our parents, our teachers um, through a series of surveys, uh, focus groups and begin to lay that foundation. At the same time, Crabtree Rural Associates is doing a deep dive into our existing facilities plans. What is the feasibilities told us? What is the mechanical studies told us? And really do a thorough analysis of what does our structures, what do our structures look like where are our strengths and weaknesses? What's the long-term sustainability? Kind of package all of these conversations that have been going over for the last two years into something that we can engage in. And then lastly, as I said, Mrs. Chichuli and her team has worked on that financing. So through the months of June and July, we're gonna to start to present that data and seek feedback, both feedback, feedback from the board, as well as feedback from the community. And that may look like an open meeting. It might be, again, COVID specific. It might be something that's in a virtual setting similar to our board meetings, but we have a chance to share what we've gathered so far, solicit feedback from the community, and then begin to gauge the board's um, guidance and will on where we're gonna move. Because eventually, as you can see, these three binds have to come together and this is where we really start to tie back into the pieces, how these three legs of that stool return in September and October to start to develop some options that are gonna really enhance, as the board has charged us, uh, optimal academic opportunities for all of our students in a sustainable framework uh, with our facilities and our finances. And then lastly, have those recommendations for the board in November. So with that in mind, one of the things that I, I do wanna close with is that in the short term, and it's, I think, interesting to say that in the short term, we're talking about a fine group of kindergartners you see before us. This is a group of our, a class of our students. This is the class of 2033. But the reason why we're saying future focused, that's just our first cohort of kindergarten. We have to keep a lens in our minds to say, where's the sustainability for longer than that? Although 2033 um, sounds like, you know, a long way away, this is the complexity of the task at hand and, and really I think a part that excites uh, the members of the committee, certainly all the individuals that I've spoken with because um, they see the value and power in this process and see the value and investment that they have and willing, willing to be a part of it. So with that, I'll turn it over to see if there's any questions. Um, Really? No questions? Great. So we'll, we'll like I mentioned, our community meeting is, is this week. Uh, and again, we're working tight, uh, very closely with Crabtree Rural Associates. So we'll maintain that communication uh, to eventually, eventually bring those bands back together. But we will be returning to the board for feedback and guidance as, as our data collection and, and our process starts to unfold in the coming weeks and coming months. Just, quick question. Sorry, as I'm, as I'm processing this. Absolutely. So when you come to the table with recommendations in November, like what does that look, what, what do you envision that looking like? Like actionable items or is this high level where we're gonna continue a discussion? Well, I shouldn't say we, whatever the new board looks like in December. I believe our hope is that we're gonna to come to the table in November with some actionable items because that is really the last kind of drop dead date if we wanna make anything possible in any of the coming years. We have, a, a, I believe, a high need for some end of life um, facility items that, that drive a lot of this conversation. I think that's where the complexity comes in. We don't wanna rush the discussions on our academic opportunities and how that can meld well together uh, and how they coalesce. But I, I do believe the, the goal of the committee and, and our charge will be to deliver to the board actionable options for them to make action on in that month of December or November if they so choose. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Krauser, do you, do you have information at this point on um, how a member of the public might view this committee meeting or is, uh, I'm assuming it'll be online. Is there information available about that? 
Sure, great question. Well, the first committee meeting we're having is is the working committee. So it's it's really for us to kind of sort and organize. The first feedback committee absolutely be publicized. We'll we'll have that available and we'll meet whatever needs the current state allows. Um, if we have to run more than one meeting on multiple sides of town, we will do that. But the meeting this week is is really the members of the, the, the individuals that have kind of stepped forward and will will be on site to 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 put some of the footwork in place that generates the, the focus group questions that kind of develops our needs assessment uh, and puts some of those layers in place. So that's not a public meeting? The first one this Wednesday is more of the steering committee to, to drive that learning part. We will have a public meeting. Uh, more than likely, we're set for kind of mid-June is where we're thinking by the time we collect the data back. Uh, what we'd like to do is collect all the data that we receive from our stakeholders, synthesize it, and then report that out so that members of the community can kind of hear where we are in a in probably more of a controlled fashion so they can hear what's been said, what's been shared, how that aligns to district goals, and, and what direction we're going to head. I'm just mindful of, uh, since this is a ad hoc committee technically from the school board, what kind of sunshine laws we need to be mindful of. And I'll let you guys figure that out. It just occurred to me that, you know, that's something we'll have to be mindful of. But thank you for your information. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you very much, Dr. Krauser. Uh, we look forward to uh, your continued reports on uh, from the side hop committee. Tonight, uh, the administrative reports. Tonight, we have Dr. Ellis and Dr. Gully. Uh, Dr. Ellis uh, from the high school, if you wouldn't mind uh, going first. Thank you, Dr. Williams. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you at uh, this time. It certainly is an exciting time. April is always a, a fun month in the high school as we're getting very close to the end and talking about some of the end of the year planning and uh, coming off a really, really awesome weekend. I'm so proud of the students with what they did with Minithon and I'm sure Carly will share some of that with you um, to raise the funds that they did with the, the amount of time and the limited structure that COVID has created was really, really awesome to see. And it was great to see them having some fun and doing some just normal student things and kid things um, this weekend. But what I want to share a little bit with you today, uh, just a highlight of some of the construction going on at the high school. And I thought that'd be sort of a unique inroads, knowing that that's one of the challenges we're facing. And one of the things the committee that we just talked about is going to be talking about. But um, our construction and manufacturing students have been hard at work, um, actually building some within our applied technology area. Um, so this is a, a, some pictures that actually from a, a construction project that Mr. Shear uh, forwarded working with Mr. Gerling. Uh, for some practical and educational purposes. Uh, within the applied uh, technology room, um, there was a large room used for instruction, a lot of wasted space and some needs that were present um, that they attempted to address through this structure that they created. Um, there's a place and say it's very practical to, to store away some of the equipment that is running continuously during class so it's not distracting to the students, uh, but it also becomes a teaching station that they can use for years. Um, they can see a lot of the pieces that go into the construction and manufacturing. And I highlighted some of those pieces down at the very bottom. You can see the bottom left-hand corner there, there's some students that are actually installing windows. Um, they actually installed a lighting fixture, a ceiling fan and ran all the electric to do that properly. They, they actually wired the electrical box, obviously under direct supervision and, and making sure that that was handled properly. They hung a door um, which having experience with that myself is something that never works quite as nicely as you would like it to. Um, and even the boring picture on the far right, um, they actually did some drywall work and had to do some taping and some sanding and, and to try to get that all smoothed out. So it was a neat project for a couple dozen students. Um, they went completely from start to finish. They worked on actually creating blueprints to make sure that they were code compliant. Uh, for this particular project. And then they worked through the process of building it. They built all the individual frames. They hung the frames. They drilled the holes into the walls with the toggle bolts to make sure it was anchored securely. Um, it is a very, very sturdy structure. Um, it's gonna provide some space for some storage above it. Um, so it was really neat to see this project go from start to completion. Really proud of how well our students did with it and giving them some different kinds of learning um, experiences than we would able to in the past. And, we're gonna leave a large portion of it open. They're not gonna completely finish it, 
because uh, there'll be opportunities for next year's class. They'll actually strip out some of the electrical pieces, let the students go through the experience of, of doing the wires again. They'll have some areas where they can put some drywall on so they can continue to have most of the experience with the exception of actually setting all the, the pieces and drilling into the walls and such. But it also is a great model. Um, there's some other areas that we'd like to do these kind of things, looking at some storage areas around our stage. Um, so we're looking forward to that as a project going forward. So. Uh, thank you for giving an opportunity to share that a little bit. Uh, please, kudos goes to Mr. Shear for great work that he's doing with our with our applied engineering students, and look forward to sharing some of these kind of things again in the future. Any questions for Dr. Ellis? Uh, just a comment. It's Joel. Hey, Brian, thank you very much for that. It really helps to see things come together in a concrete fashion. I think it's really clever that you can use this as both a uh, practical and a learning experience and something that can be essentially disassembled or at least partially and then rebuilt year after year. Very clever. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. Dr. Gully. Thank you, Dr. Williams, and good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you tonight as I wish to review some of the happenings at Indian Rock. I'll be su summarizing our return to five days of in-person schooling some recent professional development and ending with a brief review on some building information. As all of, all of you know, last uh, Tuesday, April 6th, our elementary division returned to five days of in-person instruction. I have to share that our faculty is thrilled with the return uh, to a full in-person schedule for our final week, seven weeks of school. I feel that the transition has been seamless as student routines and procedures have gone so well with the combination of our hybrid cohorts. Not only have our schools provided a positive and productive learning environment, but we've also maintained those safety protocols. I also feel too that the feedback has been positive from our families. I believe the only complaint we really have received has been from students as they are still adjusting to waking up and reporting to school each day. But our safety protocols remain in place and are certainly a priority. As we near the end of the month, uh, both Indian Rock and East York will be engaging in the administration of our PSSA assessments. Just a reminder that our administration remains the same as in past years where we'll have three ELA sections, two sections for math and two in science. And that science is for grade four only. So we'll be beginning at the uh, end of April and concluding in mid-May. Also, I wanna to touch upon the professional development and a professional learning back in February, I talked about collaboration time, uh, how each of our elementary buildings have engaged uh, in professional learning. So prior to our return uh, to our five day schedule last week, our teachers uh, engaged in their final session of understanding by design. And we've been working on that uh, since January. So for the last three months, we've really uh, tackled each of the different components, uh, really an exciting opportunity during this time as we've completed the three phases of our curriculum maps. As you will note from this slide here, you'll see teachers in cooperative groups completing stage three. Uh, I think if you were to ask the faculty and staff, they've embraced the collaboration. We've maximized good practices as we bolster our instruction and assessment. And I believe all the work we've done the last three months will certainly pave a firm foundation to continue the process when we do return in the fall. Uh, the final items I have are just building happenings. Uh, some of you may or may not have been aware, but recently you'll see the wish tree that we have there at Indian Rock. We also had one at Valley View. Uh, we did engage in a reading initiative called We Read Together. And the goal was to have all of our elementary students, our families and school staff uh, read the same book. And that was our book, Wish Tree by Catherine Applegate. So during the month of March, each day we had families read or listen to recorded chapters for 15 or 20 minutes uh, by following a designated calendar. Each family then checked the website for discussion questions, family activities, and a weekly contest. As you will note from the third and fourth slide, you'll see our families taking part in the We Read Together. We did have a virtual game night on March 30th, and I'm proud to share that we had over 70 plus families gather for the celebration. Uh, the two individuals are our reading specialists at both Valley View and Indian Rock. We have Mrs. Herman from VV and Mrs. Kuhn from Indian Rock, uh, and they organized and facilitated this joint effort. And simply put, it was just an overwhelming success. 
Uh, we would constantly hear students talking about it during the school days, and we got lots of positive praise from our families as well. So we are hopeful to do something moving, moving forward with that into next year. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see uh, some music fun with ukuleles with Mrs. Markey. Uh, the warm weather has provided our teachers with the opportunity to take the kids outside for instruction. And this is just one example of our students enjoying the technology, but also uh, the ukuleles. Uh, that was through a grant last year and uh, Mrs. Markey has used them with the students. I also wanna to touch upon our We Rock celebrations. We continue to have them every six weeks. Uh, it's part of our school-wide positive behavioral intervention and supports program. I'm proud to share that 99% of our students, they participate and are rewarded for their positive behavior and good choices. You'll notice some students on the slide here on six and seven, uh, we had an abundance of face masks. So they were making face masks using uh, uh, markers for family members and themselves. So kids were thrilled to be taking home uh, face masks for their family members. Also want to share too, each year it comes up about our Envirothon and we have had an Envirothon here at Indian Rock uh, since January, we've had virtual practices. I did want to make you aware that we do have a, have a third and fourth grade team this year, as well as a fifth grade team. And that virtual event will be taking place in the middle of May. So our teams will participate in the library on competition day and we'll be Zooming with other county schools. Also I wanna to mention too that our Book It program just concluded at the end of March. Uh, the goal of our Book It program is for students to read nightly for 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, we had about an 83 to 85% participation rate with each of our grade levels. We were hoping it would be a little higher, but anything over 80% is excellent. And through the generosity and support of our PTO, they've supplied our students with materials and treats. Uh, we've had art supplies, um, past celebrations have been milk and cookies, an electronics day, extra recess, and uh, a final reward that we actually have this Wednesday is popcorn in a movie. And lastly, uh, for those of you expecting a, a variety show in March, I will be telling you that, that the show will be going on. Indian Rock will have a virtual variety show that will be taking place probably within the next two weeks. Uh, uh, Mr. Shorb and his daughter Megan have been our co-directors and they have managed all of our virtual practice sessions uh, the last three Wednesdays. That last one concludes this Wednesday as well. And as I shared, I hope that we have uh, a week or two to put all the videos together so that way we can distribute our many talents that we have here in the building to our community members. So again, just an overview of what's taking place in addition to all the great academic uh, uh, interventions and supports and the good learning that's taking place in the building. So this concludes my report. Are there any comments or questions? Okay, thank you, Dr. Gulley. Thank you very much. And with that, that, that includes the uh, superintendent's report for this evening. Okay. Um, I have a question for you. Um, we're getting a lot of, of, of uh, money as a result of financial help with uh, COVID expenses and what have you, supposedly lots of different grant monies coming down and what have you. Um, have we given any thought to any summer programs at York Suburban, just on a voluntary basis, keep the kids reading, doing math, doing, working on some of these projects, reading together as families, things like that? Yeah, there, there are some things in the works. Um, Greg, go ahead. <laughs> You're about to say something. Yes, Dr. Ketterman, uh, we've been discussing some options for our students. We're looking perhaps at a two or three week uh, summer school at our buildings. Um, we're going to have to check funding and staffing of how we want to do that, but we are ha we do have certainly some thoughts. Nothing's been solidified just yet, uh, but we're hopeful to make those decisions soon and get information out in the beginning of May to our families. Because it certainly seems that we have a lot of that money sitting around that has to be used for, you know, for learning purposes, the loss of learning. I don't know what that means, loss of days or whatever. Do you know what I'm saying? It's not necessarily what the kids may or may not have remembered, but I didn't know. Okay, I'll look forward to hearing about that. Thank you, Dr. Golly. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Ms. Tichuli. Okay, good evening, board. Uh, the first item for consideration is the a consent agenda. 
Um, you have before you a recommendation from the Property and Finance Committee meeting. Would any board member like any of these items considered separately? Or are there any questions on any of these items? If not, the chair moves approval of the below mentioned items. Do we have a second? second? Thank you. Questions or comments? Then this can be a unanimous roll call vote. This will be considered a unanimous roll call vote unless I hear votes to the contrary. Mrs. Ciccilli, can I just ask one question there? At the bottom of the report, it talks about a guarantee of $125,000. Um, is there any reason to have a separate motion on that or is that sufficient enough to say that's what it's going to be? Do you know what I'm saying? Does it have to be a part of the minutes or something, a separate motion for any reason? No, I it don't does think not. So. Okay, just curious. Thank you. Okay, back to your vote. <laughs> this will be considered a unanimous roll call vote unless I hear votes to the contrary. Hearing none, motion passes. Item B are just items for uh, discussion tonight and a board approval on April 26. The first item is the approval of the renewal contract with Winston's School Nutrition Corp um, as a food service management company for 21-22. This is an annual requirement by the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Uh, for four years and then the school district is required to do another RFP. Any questions on this item? Which year are we in? We are in year three. Thank you. The second item is the uh, recommendation from the administration to approve the preschool child care services to the YWCA of York beginning in the 21-22 school year. Attaches the bid ratification showing the board, uh, the process in which the administration went through to reach its recommendation. Any questions on the RFP? I, are we going to get a report from Dr. Ketterman or someone on her committee as to, you know, what made this, their choice stand out and, uh, you know, why we, why we chose them uh, and anything else we need to know that might be different from when we were using Bright Horizons? Sure, Dr. Kenneman, would you like to answer? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're in the process now of working out that memorandum of understanding. Uh, what really stood out to us about them was the longevity of their leadership, um, you know, in a field that has quite a bit of transition. Uh, they have some history with us. And um, just the way that they uh, ad addressed, they had some, some really, they were really firm in their philosophies on how they uh, see children growing and, and how they help each other. Um, for example, they um, believe very strongly in, in having the, the older and the younger together, the three and four year olds. Um, and we, we talked to them a little bit about that because we're used to having them separate, but that's a, a philosophy that they have um, really become come to embrace. And they talk a lot about the transitions. It, it has less transitions for, for children and um, that they see that, they, that there's been more growth. Just they, they liken it much to uh, your household when you have siblings at home and how the younger learn from the, the older children. And uh, we liked some of their summer programming ideas and how they have uh, also their camps that they have off site that should some of the families wanna take uh, participate in that, uh, that would be part of, of what they would offer going forward and in summers to come, they're hoping that that would be some place that they would also take the students uh, once a week, just on a field trip type of basis. So we just liked a lot of what they had to offer. Okay, I was just interested. I, mean, I knew we had dealt with the YWCA previously, you know, mm -hmm. before Bright Horizons. Are they going to be used, excuse me, basically using the same rooms and facilities at the schools? And they, they will be. They'd like to start, um, they're wanting to start mainly with uh, Valley View and Yorkshire. 
Now in the past, we've had Indian Rock, you know, come to and from Valley View, but they're thinking of doing that with East York just for this first year. I think they're just uh, wanting to be a little cautious on their numbers and staffing until they know that they have and can build their, you know, participation. So, but of course that'll be yet to be seen uh, according to once they are able to do enrollments. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so to clarify then uh, for me, Tom, it'll be pre-K threes and fours plus before and after school care for what grades? For K to five. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ketterman. The item number three is an administrative recommendation for the board to deny the request to waive the penalty fees on the parcel that you see before you. Um, you the board received uh, information regarding this request. Um, are there any questions regarding this item? Just to mention that the penalty phase and the interest totals 322,000, uh, sorry, imagine that, $322 and three cents. Item number four is a recommendation for the board to approve the real estate property tax exemption certification, certification for the property that you see before you under the Pennsylvania State Veterans Commission for Real Estate Tax Exemption. This is something that is out of the district's control. Um, it's a program run for Pennsylvania uh, veterans. They have to meet a certain criteria before applying. That determination is made as to whether or not they qualify and then we're sent the information. So, and then that property is exempt not only from the school district, but also the township and uh, the county. Kathy, this may sound redundant because I think we've asked it in the past. You just got done saying this is a state requirement. We essentially have no choice and yet we're asked to vote on it. Is that correct? We are required to accept the recommendation of the, of the exception, yes. Will there be a vote on this or are you just saying this is informational tonight? No, this is a vote. Suppose we vote no. He would be exempt. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, item number five is, uh, again, an administrative recommendation for the approval of the bus van driver for Reliance Transportation for Elizabeth Caruso. So those are the items uh, scheduled for board vote on April 26th. Any last questions on those items? Okay, moving on to the informational section. Um, we, are, we have arrived to the point in the budget development for the adoption of the proposed final. Um, following a discussion with the Property and Finance Committee and other members of the board, um, a couple of weeks ago, we gave an update uh, Wendy, if you can scroll down to the bottom of this first page, okay. Since uh, April 22nd, and we did show this at the property and finance, we had one more um, or two more adjustments that were made since the property and finance committee meeting. And that was one, the reduction of cyber charter cost, um, and two, the updates to federal programs and allocations. As I previously discussed with the board, we have an increase of in our enrollment for cyber charter that is mainly due to uh, COVID. While we're uncertain uh, that we will um, have a return of these students, we're anticipating that anywhere between 20% to 50% would come back as schools um, open five days a week. And so what we've done is that we've taken our increase year over year and we've reduced 
that increased by 20%. And that had given us about 10 students um, that we hope to retain or return that will return back to either our brick and mortar or our top program, our cyber program in house. We do hope to have additional students return. We will be conducting a survey at the end of this school year um, and reaching out to those parents um, and families uh, concerning their plans for the 21-22 school year. So while we're only reducing the budget by um, a slight amount, we hope that we will realize a larger savings. The second item that we updated is the federal programs allocation. We received a funding adjustment. And so it wasn't a large amount, but um, every dollar in the revenue side matters. And so we've added that. So you'll see that our revenues are projected at $63,072,443. That includes, Wendy, if you could just scroll up a little bit to the top. Um, uh, increase in tax collection rate from 96 to 97 percent, um, an increase in taxes by 1.9 percent, and a use of fund balance of 300,000. On the expenditure side, Wendy, you can scroll back down. Our expenditures are projected at 62,874,502 which leaves us with um, a credit of $197,941. Um, and that was created because of the use of fund balance. So essentially we wouldn't have to use 300, the full $300,000 of fund balance. We would only have to use about $102,000. Are there any questions on this slide? Yeah, Kathy, just to set the, the parameters one more time, what is the assumption? First, first of all, what's the number of kids in cyber that, that we're attributing to COVID? We had an increase. We had a budgeted increase of... About 50 students. Of 50. And the assumption here is that 20% of that 50 will return? 10%, I mean, I'm sorry, 10 students would return. So it's 20% of the 50, not 20% of our total, which is more like 180. 20% of our total increased dollar amount. Okay. And just, may, it may not be appropriate for this particular sheet, but what's what's your, your feel for the, the next year or two? The next year or two is-, is In other words, are, are we gonna set it at this number and then that gets carried through in all the other expense projections? Well, there, in all my projections, we use the current forecast to move forward. That's not to say that that is how it's going to remain. When we begin the 22-23 school year budget, we'll um, adjust enrollments based on actuals. I so say- Okay. All right, 50 is the number that's the, the basis for that um, $138,000 reduction. It's 20% of that. 20% of the increase. So if our increase is close to $700,000, it's 20% off of that. Right, thank you. You're welcome. Kathy, just a question for you. You said you're expecting 20 to 50% of the cyber kids to come back. School districts right. around the state, as I was talking to my colleagues, yeah. school districts around the state, depending on their situation and how their learning modules are, they're expecting anywhere between 20 and 50%. So all the kids that went out to cyber this past year, you said there's 50 kids? Or is there's that the estimate for next year still? How, how many kids went out to cyber this past year because of COVID? It ran not including top. Right, it ranged between 50 and 55. So each, it, it fluctuated. We had enrollments, withdrawals, enrollments, withdrawals. In this budget, we had budgeted 50. Okay, so if we hit 
of the kids to come back, right? That essentially says that we balanced our budget, right? If we have 25 kids come back, we don't, we don't have, we have a balanced budget. Well, we have a better, better than a balanced budget using a 1.9% increase. Well, sorry, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm ballparking here, but I guess well, it we're would, going to be discussing a tax increase yeah. or, or use of fund balance here. Yeah, and, and I'm just, I'm it just is, curious why we're not more aggressive on getting those kids back. Have we talked to the parents? Do we, I mean, why are we using 20% and not 50%? We, ha we, have a, we have a cyber program that we developed and we spent, what, almost three quarters of a million dollars on. Are they truly COVID kids or are they kids that are doing sports or is there other reasons why they went out? I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to understand how we came up with 50 kids and it's all COVID related. I, I'm gonna ask Dr. Krauser to, to help me here. Um, not because I don't know the answer, but he- That's fine, yep. To explain it better. So, so to your first question, Mr. Sanders, um, are they all COVID? And I think as Mrs. Chichuli mentioned, some of it is kind of estimating how many have left because of COVID. And yes, we are reaching out to each one of those families. Some of it is COVID, but some of it is the result of COVID, meaning the particular learning environment they may not meeting success with have chosen to choose another environment to do it. And then to your question about, you know, why aren't they choosing our cyber option um, at top? In, in many, in, in some cases, um, it's the level of rigor of the tasks and assignments that they were asked to do. Um, some cyber programs, I'll go all the way back to Mr. Pose now, he did a great job of setting up all kinds of conversations this evening, that sometimes the reasons why they're choosing those performance is uh, the design of the, the learning and the expectations for the students is slightly different than that we have here in our in our system. So, so some of it is a combination of, one, they're seeking something that for a lack of better words, maybe easier in a learning sense, number one. Number two, it could be because of not wanting to attend school, which we're using that term COVID specific, um, and they don't want to choose our model because um, it's, you know, by design, it's, it's, it's limited by course choices. It's limited by the way we have the asynchronous session set up. So, it's a kind of a combination. I think that's where Mrs. Chichuli is referencing. She's getting feedback from her other colleagues and, and many of us are making kind of best guess estimates. Um, some of the individuals aren't returning our phone calls, uh, aren't returning our outreach and, and we're continuing to reach out and contact them as much as we can. Um, so it's, it's kind of a combination of all of that to try to get our best guess effort to certainly recruit them back, number one. And number two, if we can't get them back, can we get them into our top um, or another local option that we have with Lincoln Edge? Okay, so, and, and I appreciate the perspective there um, uh, and, and the, the additional um, color around top. A, a suggestion, mm -hmm. because we are calling out the, the cyber savings related to COVID and we're making statements that, um, you know, we're, this is COVID related. As I look through this general budget here, I think it would be helpful if we put in big, bold print and highlight it yellow, the amount of money we send out to cyber in every single budget presentation, because I think our constituents and our parents should know how much we're sending that way versus what's coming into our, our school. You know, we're only nine voices here that can express that um, uh, to the elected officials, but I think the more that, that parents and, um, and other taxpayers in our district understand exactly what's going out and why it's going out, the better off we're gonna be at spreading that message. Understood. Cool, thanks. Kathy, you mentioned that you had been in touch with your colleagues across the state. Did you get any feel for what other districts have experienced in terms of students leaving for cyber schools because of COVID? I'm just curious how we might compare, and that may be not really an easy answer, easy thing to figure out, but I'm curious. 
Well, I can share that. Um, and again, it depends on the school district. It depends on the area. But we fare better. While this is a huge increase to our budget, we fare better than some other school districts. Some other school districts have seen 100% uh, increases in their cyber uh, charter schools. So uh, for us to see you know, 50 students um, is a good thing. Thank you. Okay. Wendy, if you could put up the uh, attachment again. On the second slide, um, several members of the board had asked for different scenarios and what that would look like um, as far as tax increases and use of fund balance. So I have provided uh, different tax scenarios from 1.5% through 3.6, which is our index. And you can see uh, for the first two columns, at 1.5, we would need to use $271,964 for um, the use of fund balance. Um, with a 1.9, that decreases to $102,000. And then with a 2%, that goes down to $59,000. If we go towards the 2.5, 3% and 3.6, we would not have to use fund balance, um, it, any of the fund balance that we have set aside. On the next slide is just projections showing the use of a 1.9% tax increase and how that would affect us moving forward, assuming that in the 2021 school year, uh, we would uh, realize the $1.7 million deficit that we had projected. As I stated uh, several meetings ago, I do not anticipate that we would meet that full 1.7. Um, at that time, we were in the range of 300,000. And I shared with the board that as we receive invoices and continue to move towards this current year, that they that may fluctuate from year to year. As we stand today, it is closer to about $550,000. Um, and so we'll get a better idea when we do this month's end close. So if we could go back to the board agenda. I think before you leave this slide, sure. as, you're, as you're projecting out, that's assuming nearly max tax increases after this year, correct? Yes. So none of my uh, projections moving forward have changed. Um, if you wanted to review the budget projections moving forward, um, it is included in the uh, February 22nd uh, board presentation, okay. and you'll see that I've used the IFO's uh, projected index. Thank you. Mm -hmm. now, Kathy, you this is Joe. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Did you also have uh, impact to taxpayers? Was there a column on the previous slide where you had the, the different um, percentages of tax increase? No, ma'am. That was not included in that slide, but I can bring it up. Okay, thank you. And in, in this one, Kathy, in the other expenditure item, 22 budget reflects the uh, reduction in the charter, the cyber charter cost. Is there a, further, is there a further reduction in the out years or is that, is that, is that whatever that number is for cyber, is that assumed to grow at 2%? It's assumed to grow at 2%. Okay, I'm, I'll just say right now, I have a real serious problem with that. I understand the thinking, but the problem I'm having with that is that that's a program that we just simply can't let grow at, at an inflation rate. There has to be stronger management and stronger incentive to get those kids back in our, in our district. So I'd, I'd be much personally much more comfortable with a profile that declines, that you know brings those kids back in, and that that's, that's part of the objective. And whether that's creating a need to use fund balance or not, it's got to be exposed. 
we, we can't just notch, you know, take 10 kids out and then let it run. It paints a picture of our financial position that cannot be real and it can't be sustained. If we have a model here that, that shows a district that is in financial disarray and a couple things come to mind. We either have an education model that can't be sustained or we have somehow or other not really gotten a hold of our expenses in the way we project these. I, I think it may be important to keep in mind that a 2% uh, projection of, of cost for cyber charters doesn't reflect a 2% growth in enrollment of char cyber charters. Because we have to remember that the tuition rate for cyber charters grows from year to year based on the prior year's budget. Yeah, I understand that, Tim. But if the number of kids remains constant, it, that the implication is that we're not bringing them back in. Understood. But I so, don't want the perception to be out there that we're projecting 2% growth in the number. No, I get that. It's, it's, I understand that. It's, it's expense inflation rated that, related, that sort of thing. I get that. But it, it also has embedded in it a constant number of kids. Not a growing number, a constant number. And it would seem to me like that number might be 160. Take the 180, bring it, I'm sorry, not even that, 170. Take the 180, reduce it by 10, and then carry it forward. That's the implication. I just don't think that's aggressive enough. Well, m Mr. Sears, what I would say is that um, projections are just that. They're our best guess as to what's going to happen in those future years. I, I, I would not be comfortable with reducing um, to have a gradual reduction in enrollment um, in future years would not, without having a guarantee. I think I would be misrepresenting our financial situation if I took it for granted that we would get back our students. Now, I would gladly do that if I had a guarantee, but I don't. Well, there's, there's no guarantee of any of it, Kathy. I understand that. But from the standpoint of how this makes the district look five years hence, there's an underlying assumption that we'll still be financing 170 cyber kids. That's, that's what's embedded in this. And each year we develop the budget, it will come down to actual. So if next September we're in a better position and we only have 150 kids versus 170 kids, then my projections are going, are, are going to change, not only for 22, 23, but moving forward. But again, wouldn't that, let's just say for the sake of discussion, it really it drops to 150. Is that the number that would be embedded from that point forward until yes. you see evidence of change? Yes, and that's the practice that has always been the practice. All right, then to my way of thinking, anytime we look at cumulative anything, deficits or cumulative revenues or expenses in the out years, we should just ignore them because they're based on assumptions that are really flat, not flat line, but they're based on essentially the footprint that we have right now plus an inflation factor whenever right now happens to be evaluated. I don't I'm, think not, I'm not sure it's valid to say you can ignore it. You have to project out. But John, you if, you're not, if you're not allowed to, to look at some realistic expectation, for example, in the, in the reduction of the number of cyber kids, or even if you wanted to do sensitivity analysis and say, well, what if it gets even worse? I have no problem with that. But but just to hold it constant doesn't doesn't give me any comfort that administrations come to Kathy and said, our goal is to reduce this number and to get it down, say, to 100, 100 by 2026. What would that impact be? Well, I don't think that that's, I don't think that that's the job of the projections. The job of the projection is to, is to try to make every effort to show what our financial um, situation is. It's the job of the administration on an annual basis and rather on a daily basis to make sure that we're operating efficiencies and we're trying to uh, recruit those students back. It's not dependent on the projections that we provide. Well, I get that, Kathy, but the projections reflect the expectation. Well, but hold on here for a second. We're gonna, we, we had a whole long discussion, John, and, and I agree with you, John, I, we can't ignore it. 
And and I remember you uh, saying multiple times, and and forgive me if I'm misquoting you, but you you kept asking why we keep running we keep running a surplus for many years in our in our fund balance. Where's it coming from? And I think understanding the assumptions that underlie uh, what these projections look at will help us to determine, for example, what our tax rate increase is going to be this year. We, we spoke at nauseum about that at the Finance and Property Committee the other night that, well, I would advocate going to the maximum. Well, of course you would if you saw this, but if you understood truly what is going into the cyber charter numbers, for example, and, and how we can get re recoup those expenses, then I don't know if I necessarily agree that we would go to the max yeah, and, if you know, we can I get think, 15 think, more kids back. I'm just throwing that out there. It's it's These are the levers and, and the assumptions that come about with it. And, and, and to this point, I guess what would concern me with, with Joel's argument, if I was going to create the budget and said, well, the business, you know, the administration is going to work really hard. So let's just assume that number is zero. Then we say everything's well in the world. And that's not, that's not reality. I think we have to start with what we know and project out based on that. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think, yeah, I think that that it's great to look at the picture. I think Kathy's projecting this correctly. That's like the best best guess we can give it now. And I also think it would behoove us to not think that this is the reality five years from now. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm going to make a decision on a tax rate based on next year. And I'm going to hope like... I'm going to really hope that what's on this page for five years does not come to pass because we change those assumptions as the years pass. That's our job. But I, but I don't want to go to bed all happy tonight thinking that we're good five years from now because we tweaked an assumption based on something that might happen. Quite honestly, I want Tim getting up every day wondering how he's going to get those kids back, how he's going to change those numbers. And I want it I want it right in front of him. I want these bad numbers in front of him every day. Sorry, Tim. You know, I don't want you sleeping nicely. I want you looking at a problem. And, and I don't want it to look any rosier than, than it could be. Because I think this is, this is the reality if we don't change anything. I'd like We've got to wake up every day looking for things to change. Mike, if it wasn't the 50 bump from COVID, I think I would agree with that. But there was a special circumstance that led to that surge. And now we're going to bake it into the budget. Uh, we're baking it into a projection, not the budget. Either way, the numbers are, are what they are. They tell the public something that they may not quite get. And it makes it look like we, even with maximum tax increases, cannot balance our budget. That's what it makes it look like. And I expect that the public thinks we're going to figure that out before that comes to pass five years from now. Well, I guess- uh, That's our job. They'll let us know at the voting booth, won't they? Yep. I have a couple of thoughts on, on this. First, first, I, I agree with uh, Kathy's analysis in this myself and, and Mike's comments. I also agree with uh, James's uh, recommendation that we somehow publicly display uh, the costs more prominently, the cost of the uh, cyber, uh, you know, the, the leakage of our tax monies um, into cyber education, that that somehow be highlighted more effectively uh, on a regular basis. And then I've, I have one question uh, that, that relates to our decision this year. And it's a follow-up from something you said, Joel, in that at a prior meeting, I, I had made the suggestion that we ought to set a tax rate this year that brings uh, our use of fund balance to zero, uh, that that's the most prudent choice uh, given what we're facing in future years. And uh, then, then Joel had made a comment that we actually ought to be using some of our fund balance to follow through in some obligation. And I, I would just like to understand that point of view better and what the argument is there. So uh, is there a reason by obligation that we ought to be spending some fund balance? I, I think I, I would answer quickly and then Joel can yeah. weigh in. We taxed the community with the expectation that we were going to create this fund balance. If you remember what I said, and we were going to put it into buckets, we were going to put it into a committed bucket where we we're going to commit it to the way we're being treated about retirement. 
Retirement's going up every year. There's no mechanism for supporting that. So we've set aside money to deal with that over the next several years. We have committed that money to do that. It would be disingenuous to say, well, now what we're going to do is we're going to raise taxes and not use that money that we identified several years ago. You know, so I, so I think once you've said we're going to set aside this money for a committed purpose, you know, you, you have an obligation to stay with that unless there's some real justification not to. Well, we will be using that money. The question is, uh, is there, for what is we there said. a sense of obligation to, to use it this year? That is, it's clear we're going to be using yes. that money. I mean, our fund balance is going to be going down rapidly. Uh, it's just a question of when. So, I mean, maybe I'm asking a nuanced question. It's, it's one of what's the nature of this obligation and do we have to, dis are we obligated to discharge it this year? Uh, whatever that is. And if we are, what, what is that amount? Do I remember Kathy, you quoting something like that would be 187,000 or uh, I just wanna get a little clear on this point because uh, this gets to the final details, I think of uh, what the tax rate should be. So we, prior to my arrival, we, we had agreed that we would use $300,000 annually. Mm -hmm. That the, the increase out of PEASERS, um, the increase year over year for this, uh, for 2021-22 is about 175,000 after the state reimbursement. Okay. So if the board elected not to use the full 300,000, we could use this 175,000 or whatever that number is to cover the increase from 2021 to 21-22. And the suggestion is that's in the spirit of what we had as a board thought would be appropriate from prior discussions in years past. You know, yes. we, made, we made a strategic decision a couple of years ago to use uh, the money set aside for, for retirement fund, PEASERS. Uh, it, it was maybe three or four million dollars. I can't remember three. how high it was. And we made the strategic decision to use $300,000 annually from that set aside of monies mm -hmm. to fund the PEASERS portion of our, or help fund the PEASERS portion of our budget. Obviously, that doesn't fund all of it, only small funds a small portion of it. But that was the decision and that would, that decision was to cover us for 10 years, for a decade. Okay. That, that was the, that's the obligation, if you want to call it that. That's the, the self-imposed obligation. Got you. So it's just following through. I see. So it's a, the word obligation there is a bit of a loose sense then. It's sort of following through on, on guidelines that we had affirmed in the past. A couple of years ago, yes. Right, and if we were to follow through on those, then the 1.9% tax increase would be almost spot on. Correct. Yeah. yeah. It, it Actually, our deficit is only $102,000 if we did a 1.9% mm -hmm. tax increase. Right, got it. Kathy, have there been years where the 300,000 was not adequate to cover the increase? I, I wouldn't be asking, I mean, we can defer that question, but yeah, I, we said 300,000, that was a maximum, not a minimum. Correct. And there were times where there were large spikes in the rates. Now that the, the rates have leveled off slightly, I mean, we're still, I mean, considering we're close to 40%, but now that this, the, the rates have leveled off, slightly, we're not seeing as large of an increase in pension year over year as we had be in prior years. If I could inject as a historian, um, way back quite a few years ago, we were anticipating and were told about great significant rate increases in the future. So at that time, what the board was looking at and the administration was looking at is the fact that, well, we can save for those increases and result in larger spikes and balance out that over time. 
So that actually goes back quite a few years where we were saving for those large increases that have happened over the last over the last five years. And as Kathy has said, we have gone through those spikes and we are now in a more stable 40%, but still stable, you know, level of those retirement rates. So it was not necessarily so much the year to year increase as the dramatic increase from the previous rates, where at one point, you know, they were down under 1%. Mm -hmm. yeah, but to, to clarify a question, I think that Steve asked earlier, it, the obligation to use it this year is even even looser. We could not use it and, and use it next year, say, or the next year. Correct, the, dis the use of fund balance is at the discretion of the board. Yeah, there's nothing binding. Well, the only thing binding is what I would call our word. We gave the taxpayers our word that that was what that money would be used for. And I'm strongly suggesting that we continue to use the 300,000 in order to pull down the tax rate slightly. Maybe we could balance it at 1.8. That's the word we gave taxpayers. We pre-taxed them so that we could soften the blow. That's what we're supposed to do. One other question I have just in terms of what we're voting on tonight. I came out of the, the uh, finance meeting thinking that tonight we are gonna be voting on a proposed expenditure, but not on proposed revenue. That is, I thought we were going to be voting on the tax rate proposal at a later time. So maybe you could just clarify, um, maybe I misunderstood the conclusion of that pro uh, finance meeting, but that's, that's how, I, how I had understood it. The proposed budget, um, the proposed budget is just that, a proposed budget. Anything can change between now and the final adoption. So even if you adopted this proposed budget, which includes expenditures and revenues. That's why I added that the, the revenue piece on it. If the board should decide, whether it be at the uh, April 26th meeting or the first meeting in May that we would wanna change the tax rate, we can certainly do so prior to that vote. Okay. The, the, the very last minute to change those rates is by June 30th of each year. So we have plenty of time between now and that and the the day that we have scheduled for the final budget adoption to change the rate. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Yes. And Mrs. Schrader had asked me for just this one document. And so I'd like to share that. Can you see my screen? Yep. Do you see the uh, taxpayer impact here? Yeah. Okay. I'll just make it a little bit larger. Is that good? Yes, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Now this is assuming this wouldn't be the same for everyone. This is assuming the medium assessed value in York Suburban of $156,450. So if I'm reading that correctly, a 1.9% tax increase would mean for the median household a $70 increase in their tax bill. Correct. Okay, any more questions on this? Okay, if we can go back to the agenda, um, Wendy, please. So with that, 
Uh, item D is, the, the following items are for board vote. Item D is uh, the administration recommends the board approve a budgetary reserve of $500,000 for unanticipated expenditures for 21-22. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Would this then be added to the budget, Kathy, to cover it? Or this will be added to the 62.8 million. Thank you. So I think this can be a unanimous roll call vote. This will be considered a unanimous roll call vote unless I hear votes to the contrary. No. Okay, no. let's have a roll call vote then. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sullivan. Yes. Mr. Tillman. No. Mr. Sears. No. Mr. Robinson. Yes. Mrs. Fryrick. Yes. Mr. Sanders. No. Mr. Posnow. Yes. Mr. Scalette. Yes. Mrs. Schrader. Yes. Motion passes 6 3. Item E is the motion to approve the proposed final. The proposed final general fund budget for 21-22, including all allocations plan for planned expenditures of $62,874,502, which includes a proposed tax increase of 1.9%. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Thank you. Discussion, questions? I will not be supporting this, uh, so we have to take a roll call vote, Mr. Pesnow. Okay. Not supporting why? Uh, because I, as I've stated in the past, I'm disappointed that we have eliminated certain positions um, uh, and, and I feel that that's just not in the best interest of our students. I can see where that makes sense with uh, revenue. Other, other questions? Well, as I've stated at the finance meeting, I, I won't be supporting this either. Um, my thought is with such dire straits coming down the pike uh, in years to come with the projections being using the max amount possible that it's prudent that we increase taxes a bit more than 1.9 to try to balance the blow. So, Mr. Robinson, you made the motion, correct? I did. Would you be willing to table your motion to allow for another motion from Ms. Schrader? Of course. Okay, thank you. Ms. Schrader, do you have a motion? Uh, I, would, I would prefer 2.5. So I, I guess I move that our the motion be amended to a tax increase of 2.5. Is there a second? I second. Thank you. Questions, comments? Sure. Why 2.5? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear you. Why 2.5? Well, as I said, I just think it's prudent to increase taxes a bit more. This is uh, according to the table that uh, Kathy showed earlier about $90 uh, increase uh, over the, as compared to rather the 70 some dollars. So what I'm talking about is a, a $20 uh, tax increase difference uh, to the average median home. Uh, and yet it would generate, uh, I believe about 400 grand, help me, Kathy, um, that could be used down the road. And I just think we're going to be in dire straits if we believe the projections. 
we're going to be in dire straits and 400 grand might come in handy when it uh, is only means a difference of about $20 to the average home. That's my so reason. Why, so why not go the maximum? And if it's 20, why not, why not go 120? Well, I mean, as I said, James, my goal is to, to, to increase it slightly so as not to uh, cause as much damage to the taxpayer. That's and that's assuming the, the underlying expense budget is realistic so that we don't bring any more cyber kids back and we keep them at 170 kids, right? I mean, that, that's more of the opportunity versus continuing to squeeze the taxpayer in my view. Well, you have your view, I have my view. My I agree, I'm just, I'm giving, I'm giving the counter. I, 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 I think going down that path only serves to um, increase the chances of what what we have discussed over the years, which is Shazam, how do we how do we wind up increasing our surplus every year? Well, that it's because we have an expense assumption that drives these little itty bitty creases, but over time, unfortunately, it continues to tax the taxpayer here when it's not the taxpayer that is causing this situation. Well, we either believe the projections or we don't. And really we have no choice but to believe them. We, we, no, have, I, we absolutely have a choice. That's okay. absolutely not true, Lois. And we can question the assumptions. We can look for reasonability in any, in any of them. The percentages, for example, that are used to grow the payroll costs, we can question them. We know they're going up, but they're certainly subject to question. Well, I'm not prepared to act on our opinions versus what our our business manager has projected. I mean, I'm not I'm not willing to stand up and say we we have to use a, a cyber figure uh, less than what she has discussed with her colleagues and thinks is a prudent number. Uh, but you're I mean, prepared. But you're prepared to say twenty dollars on the taxpayer. Well, that's okay, but we won't do. You know, we won't do the max then because that, I mean, theoretically, how do you know $20 isn't, isn't a utility bill for somebody? I, I don't. I'm not making well, a line. Well, you're making an assumption then. I, that's all I'm saying is, is we're, we're, I, 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 I don't, I'm not, I'm not saying what you're saying is wrong. What I'm saying is I think that we're not looking at the whole picture in terms of assumptions. Well, and you may have, you may have a point. But at the same time, it, in my mind, it's, it's easier to err in that direction than to, mm. to be in a situation down the road where we're in dire straits, which I, I think we all agree we're going to be. So I'm just thinking that it's easier to, to modify that blow down the road by increasing it slightly. We've already done away with I don't know, three or four teaching positions. We've already made some really serious cuts, which hurts all of us. And I don't think anybody on my tiny little screen here really was happy that any of those choices had to be made, that we had to, to cut any of those positions. I would never say that about my colleagues on the board, but I just think it's prudent to increase our uh, tax rate slightly so that it can, can produce a little more money for us for down the road. That's my thought process. I, I'd also like to, to add in the, uh, the, the thought that this is a budget where the administration has worked very hard to lower the costs. And, um, and I, I think making references to past administrations uh, might not apply so readily to what we have uh, with our current superintendent and team in terms of a, a goal toward efficiency and operations. And, and I would say in addition to that, that this current budget is in the face of a, of a variety of uh, cuts that I think the administration felt that they had to respond to in the face of, a, of direction from the board. So that I, I think the public should know that uh, we're not hiring librarians that uh, would be somewhat appropriate to hire, and and we're not we're not um, hiring uh, phys ed teachers that would be somewhat appropriate to hire. 
but we're not. And, and there's other cuts uh, that were in this budget. And uh, by, by setting tax rates such that, such that we're, we're saying to the administration, you're, you're gonna have to continue to whittle away and make cuts. Uh, I think that as a board, um, you know, we have to, we also have to weigh exactly the pressure points that, uh, that we have choices over and then that we're putting on the administration in terms of the cuts over the next, over the next several years. Um, so to me, that's, that's also a relevant, a relevant point to this. And, uh, and I regard um, uh, the proposal that Lois Ann is putting out as, as quite, quite reasonable. I mean, I think 1.9% is reasonable. I think 2.5% is reasonable. I mean, I think there's a range of reasonableness here, but I, I think uh, there's, a, there's a lot to be said, I think, for the number that Lois Ann proposed. So oh, I would just like yeah, to say, I, I would like to, I would, I would like to offer my compliments to the administration for trying really hard uh, to bring these costs down. I mean, I do compliment them on that. On the other hand, I don't want the board to be in a position situation where we're forcing the administration to take cuts that are really uh, taking away from academic quality. And I, I, I'm, I'm at this point to me, that's a great concern, I think, for us as a board. I'm sorry, Mike. Um, I, I would just like to say, I'm, I'm gonna go back to what I said before. The, the projections are what they are. I think Kathy's done them correctly, but I don't think they're gospel. They're not written in stone and they won't be, you know, until the end of each year. And there's a lot of time to change what those projections will look like. And so I'm not prepared to go um, assuming those projections are gonna be correct to build up a build up money to pay for what we think might happen in five years so I, quite honestly i think what our numbers show us we intended to put three hundred thousand to to uh to fund balance for retirement and at 1.5 percent we would be using two hundred seventy thousand dollars and I'd be much more likely to vote for 1.5% than 2.5%. So let, let's, let's do this. Let's have a roll call vote on the motion on, on the floor, which is to accept the, the budget number and fund it with a 2.5 increase. Mr. Shuley, can we have a roll call vote on that, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Sears? No. Mrs. Schrader? Yes. Mrs. Fryrick? No. Mr. Sanders? No. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Robinson? No. Mr. Toman? No. Mr. Posnow? No. Mr. Scalette? Yes. Motion passes. Um, motion fails. Three six. <laughs> Sorry. So, shall we go back to Mr. Robinson's original motion? To 1.9. I'm not, yeah. You, Let's try that, yeah. Okay. Could you make that motion again, Mr. Robinson? Uh, sure, so moved. Okay. <laughs> Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. I'm Thank sorry, you. who is the second? Okay. Mrs. Schrader. No. No. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Scalette? Yes. Mrs. Fryrick? No. Mr. Toman? Yes. Mr. Pilsnow? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Sanders? Yes. Mr. Sears? No. Motion passes three. 
Okay. Item F is um, the administration recommends the board approve the resolution of authorizing the administration to advertise and publicly display the board's intent to adopt a 21-22 final general fund budget at a regular meeting scheduled on May 24th. That date is subject to change. So, so moved. Lois, you take the movement, I'll, I'll second. Okay. Questions or comments? I think this can be a unanimous roll call vote. I'm sorry, can I just ask what might make us change that date, Mr. Chili? I believe we have graduation on the 24th. Okay, okay, just wanted to confirm. Yeah, we're, we're considering uh, asking you to move the uh, board meeting to the following night. So potentially, potentially the 25th. All right. Other questions? This can be a unanimous roll call vote. This will be considered a unanimous roll call vote unless I hear votes to the contrary. Hearing none, motion passes. Last item, item G, the administration recommends the board authorize the business office to advertise and solicit bids to procure Windows laptops. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Questions, comments? What are they to be used for, Kathy? Mr. Henry? Yes, I will feel that. Um, these would be replacement laptops for teachers at the high school, middle school, East York and Indian Rock. They're part of our regular six year replacement cycle. Um, and normally we purchase off a contract right now. We're, we're struggling on some of those contracts. So we're just taking this option in case we are not able to purchase off an established contract. What would keep us from us from purchasing off the contract, Vince? Um, the availability of the desired products on the contracts. Okay, and roughly how many are we talking about? About 200. And the budget? Um, uh, roughly 200,000, okay. about 180 actually. And that would be in this upcoming year? That's correct. Thank you. Other questions? I think this can be a unanimous roll call vote. This will be considered a unanimous vote call vote unless I hear votes to the contrary. Hearing none, motion passes. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Ms. Bowen, give us some good news. Good evening. Uh, I would like to start off by saying that our mini-thon was held on Saturday, as you guys know, and it was very successful. Uh, we were able to raise over $48,000 for pediatric cancer, and we were all very grateful that we could still do an event this year and raise so much money for the kids. Next. Our prom event is coming closer and tickets have been opened to the seniors as of today and leftover tickets will be sent out to juniors next week. Lastly, PSATs and SATs are this week at the high school, which leads me to say that I will be taking the SAT tomorrow morning. So I'm going to be signing off now to get a good night's rest. And with that being said, that concludes my report. Okay. Thank you. Get a good night's sleep. Okay, thank you. Um, the committee meeting schedule is posted. The, the link is online. Uh, Mr. Scalat, academic standards and curriculum. Oh yes, thanks. There's one item uh, recommended for approval on April 26th. Uh, following discussion at the February 16th committee meeting, the committee recommends approval of the limited expansion of concurrent dual enrollment for high school students. So in effect, this is 
allowing students to take college classes for high school credit. This has existed historically, and now the district is wanting to expand eligibility. So there are more ways to accomplish this. I don't know, Dr. Krauser, if that was a sufficient explanation. It was, it, you know, this is just a continuation of that came out of the Academic and Standards Committee meeting last time we had the meeting. Are there any questions on this proposal? Is that it? That's it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Robinson, personnel. Thank you, Mr. Pose. Now, you have before you the personnel report, which includes right, res resignation, retirement, employment, extracurricular, and leave of absence. Would any board member like any of these items considered separately, or are there any questions on any of these items? If not, the chair moves approval of the below mentioned items. We have a second. Second. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? And I think this can be a unanimous roll call vote. This will be considered a unanimous roll call vote unless I hear votes to the contrary. Hearing none, motion passes. That concludes my report. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sears. Property and finance. Um, I think you have policy. I'm sorry, I, sk I skipped Mr. Toman. I'm sorry. <laughs> policy review, Mr. Toman. Policy review committee. Uh, we've provided the minutes from our January 25th meeting uh, through link. Please review those. And there are eight policies that were discussed at the March 22nd committee meeting and recommended out of committee for first read by the board at this meeting and the April 26th meeting. Are there any questions on any of those eight policies? Hearing none, that's all I have to report. Okay, thank you. Now, Mr. Sears. Thank you, Mr. Posnell. Property and finance uh, met April 6th. Minutes of the February 1st meeting are linked to tonight's agenda. And uh, all board members attended, which I want to thank you all for. It takes a lot of time and energy to attend committee meetings. Mr. Henry presented his updated solution for the intercom and clock systems, which had been considered in the past. The recommended solution uh, will cost the district 43,812, and the complete system bids in the past were over 408 and 700,000 each. The district will apply the proceeds of a $40,000 grant to cover the outstanding cost, which is roughly 41,000. Mrs. Fry presented the food service budget which was approved earlier this evening, along with the extension of Whitson's contract. Ms. Chichuli noted that she intends to move $2.462 million currently in the general fund for health costs to a new fund to cover insurance claims in bad years. Mrs. Chichuli led a lively discussion of the proposed general fund expense budget, which we approved this evening. She explained that before we open our doors on a day-to-day -day basis, 80% of our budget is already committed to salaries, benefits, and debt service. Rather than trying to reiterate all the points made by board members in that meeting and, and this evening, I would urge everybody in attendance in this, this evening to review the video of the Finance Committee meeting and reflect on the discussion earlier this evening regarding the budget. There was no public comment. Meeting adjourned at 642. Our next meeting is September 7th at 5 p.m. That concludes my report. Okay, thank you. Mr. Robinson, back to you. Legislative update. Thank you, Mr. Pose. Now, on the legislative update front, I would like to report that uh, in response to a letter from Representative Stan Saylor urging us to retain library positions, uh, three members of the board wrote to Mr. Saylor to outline why this position or this suggestion was ill-advised. In addition, Dr. Williams put together a brilliantly reasoned op-ed article that appeared in the Penn Capital Star. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Posnow's address this evening is also going to be applicable as an op-ed. In addition, if I may, I would like to uh, refer back to a comment made by my good friend and colleague, Mr. Tolman, regarding the importance of Dr. Williams spending every waking minute 
thinking about the retention of cyber charter students. I would urge all of us to engage in a similar activity because it's not just Dr. Williams' challenge, it's all of our challenge, it's all a challenge to all of us. Let me phrase it that way. And if we are so inclined, I would urge all of you to write to your local representative and state senator and ask those rascals why they're aiding and abetting extortionate payments to cyber charter schools. That concludes my report. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Robinson, can I ask you a question, please? You may. I believe we sent out an invite to our meeting yeah, this evening to our elected representatives, um, urging them to listen to our discussion in addition to listening to uh, our discussion from the property and finance. Did any of them respond? To my knowledge, no one responded directly. No one contacted okay. me and I, I believe no one contacted uh, Dr. Williams. That does not mean that the invitation was not accepted by either the elected official or members of their staff. And I would say that probably a, a large number of them are riveted to this discussion tonight. If not, I'm sure we'll all be sorely disappointed. Well, it would be nice to know if any of them were on tonight. I would have to defer to Mr. Henry as to whether or not we can determine that. I know I, I don't know, but uh, perhaps we can get follow on responses to uh, uh, to Dr. Williams or perhaps any of the press that are out there listening to this meeting because we put together some very good points. And if any press are out there listening, I'd appreciate it if you could reach out to our elected representatives and ask if they listen to our discussion here because it's important that they understand that we are discussing what their actions mean for our local budgets. And if I might expand on that point, Mr. Sanders, if any uh, staff members or elected officials are listening in, perhaps they could use this opportunity to make a public comment that we will review shortly. Now that concludes my report. Well, wait a minute. I have a, I have a, a question or a comment for you, Rich. Um, okay. Both of these uh, op-ed pieces that have been mentioned from John and from Dr. Williams, uh, I, I would like to suggest that they be posted on our website. I don't know where or how. I'll leave that up to the powers that be, but We've referred to them several times, and I think it would be nice for our, our York Suburban community to have easy access to those. And I would also like to, to ask if we've, we've been pounding on this unreasonable uh, policy, at least I think it's unreasonable, regarding um, the, the cost of the cyber charter schools. One more time, just again, in case anybody is listening, if I decide to send my sophomore in high school to a cyber charter school instead of to York Suburban High School, it's not free. The commercials say it's free, but York Suburban pays how much, Mrs. Chichuli? Do you have that handy? Uh, 15,000. 15,000 a person. 15,000 for a regular student. And only $819 of that comes from the state. Okay. That's the kind of thing that we need to, 15,000, uh, it needs to be spelled out again, just to have this in the minutes, if nothing else. I, I know succinctly that, you know, Mrs. Smith down the street has no clue that this is the case. She believes the commercial that says it's free. So just get off my soapbox now, but thanks to those who've written the, the op-ed pieces and to Rich and his crew for doing what we can to shake somebody by the shoulders and get them to listen. Thank you. Anybody else? One more. M Mr. Sanders, I will say that of all the representatives, uh, representatives Carol Hill Evans, took the time to reach out to me to have a discussion about what is really hurting the school districts and from an educational point of view, what could be done. So we do have one representative that's actually interested in talking to us. So. 
And well, on that note, I will conclude this is a red letter night for the legislative liaison. I don't think we've ever had this much discussion <laughs> ever. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Fryer. And now I'll try and cheer you up with the report from the LIU. Um, you have before you the dawn's early light, which is the highlights of the LIU board meeting of April 6th. Um, lots going on out there. Um, they did, they were very, very busy during all the time that they were giving the COVID vaccines out there. And they were very pleased with how that worked out um, over those couple of weekends. Um, I have no report from the LIU um, operating uh, committee. And York Adams Academy report, uh, we are busy interviewing for the director position. We have some very, very good looking candidates. Uh, I'm always pleased to report that York Suburban is using 15 of the 15 seats that they have, which is good to see. Uh, and we are trying to work on some sort of graduation event. We're not sure exactly what it will look like, but we are trying to be in touch with the LIU and see what we can work out at the York Learning Center. And that concludes my reports. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chuley, York Adams Tax Bureau. No report. Thank you. York County School of Technology, Ms. Schreider. You're muted. Okay, sorry. Uh, I would like to publicly thank the uh, administration at the School of Technology uh, for their leadership through COVID. They have just, I think, done a stellar job in getting their students um, well-educated this, this school year. Uh, they are today, in fact, doing the next couple of days, doing their um, national test, testing. It's called the NOCTI exam that each, um, each school, each department uh, does and it's their card carrying certificate as they go out into the, uh, the working world that shows that they are competent in their skills. And it, we, they weren't able to take them last year and they determined we're going to figure out how to get it done and they did that this year and it's ongoing. So my hat is off to them and I just wanted to share with uh, the, my colleagues on the board that they, they've done a great job. They've got um, graduation planned uh, out at the fairgrounds and they're going to do two full graduations so nobody and no families feel slighted um, and they've just, they've just done a great job and um, I just, I wanted to share that with you. Also, my hat is off to the, um, the group that planned the, um, the gymnasium, uh, the construction of the new gymnasium there. Uh, they have had virtually no, less than 1% um, of the overages in their bidding process. And um, they've just, they've done a great job. I was there today and, and went through the facility and it's, it's going to be a very nice uh, facility for community use. They're hoping to get things like league playoff games and that kind of thing to, uh, to use it as a, as a neutral ground. So um, they've, done a, they've done a great job with it. So thank you. That, unless there are questions, concludes my report. Okay, thank you. I would like to take this time to welcome and thank everybody who has sat through this with us online tonight. The link to the board meeting schedule is here and this is the final opportunity to view public comment. Despite the impassioned plea from Mr. Robinson, we have no additional public comment. Hmm. Okay, go figure. Um, and unless anybody has anything else, I think we can be adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>